10 to 12 million Africans were brought to the Americas as slaves by the transatlantic slave trade. The triangular trade is something you've probably heard of. Furthermore, the economic plight of Africa, a key player in this commerce, contrasted sharply with that of the other two triangle members. That will be addressed soon. Most historians agree that 1526 was the year of the first slave trade between Africa and the Americas. However, this practice of buying Africans as slaves from Europe predates even this era, as European explorers enslaved even the indigenous people of the Americas. The Spanish monarchy forbade the importation of African slaves prior to 1518, not out of any compassion or concern for human dignity, but because they held the view that Africans were inherently savage and would contaminate European culture with their pagan and non-Christian beliefs and practices. But that choice was reversed over time for economic reasons. King Charles V authorized Lorenzo de Gorovod to bring 4,000 slaves from Africa straight to the Spanish-American territories on August 18, 1518. As time went on, King Charles relaxed the rules set by his grandfather and made it legal to import slaves from Africa into the Spanish Americas, but only if they were to be converted to Christianity while in transit. The number of Africans brought to the Americas as slaves increased dramatically once this new rule went into effect. The Western Hemisphere saw a dramatic increase in slave trade activity. Slaves were captured by Europeans who kept them in forts along the coast of Africa before transporting them to the Americas. Because malaria was so common in sub-Saharan Africa, European slave dealers typically stayed out of the raids because their life expectancy was shorter than a year. As a result, the majority of slaves sold to Western Europeans during the transatlantic slave trade originated in Central and West Africa, where West Africans also kidnapped them. Slaves were a vital commodity for the plantations of the European colonies in the Americas, and the transatlantic slave trade was pivotal to the economics of the entire triangle trade route. You absolutely must like this video and subscribe to the channel if you want to see more videos like it. With your help, we will keep continuing, even though they don't want us to share these stories. First, let's take a closer look at the triangle trade and see what it was all about. In its most basic form, the triangular trade route was a system of trade that extended across the Atlantic. From Europe to Africa, products could be transported over this triangular trade route that crossed the Atlantic. Wine, clothes and weapons are among the commodities sent to Africa. A second leg of the triangle represented the transatlantic slave trade that brought Africans to the Americas and the West Indies. The final leg of the triangle represented the transportation of plantation-grown commodities to European markets, including sugar, coffee, tobacco, rice and cotton. Capital came from Europe, labor came from Africa, and land and resources came from the Americas, the three continents that made up the triangle. You could always count on a steady supply for the European market. All the people on those three continents are intertwined in the transatlantic slave trade narrative, but the Middle Passage voyages are front and center. The term Middle Passage describes the trade route that slaves were transported along. Many hardships and occasionally death characterize the journey. The journey can take three to six months, given the right conditions. Not only did the ship's crews perish throughout the harrowing voyage, but so did the people being carried as slaves. Sailors on slave ships had a death rate of about 20%. Ships ranged in size and passenger capacity, but they all shared a common design. Inhumane conditions prevailed on board these ships. Slaves of African descent were confined below deck in overcrowded conditions with limited access to natural light. In order to guarantee that they arrived in Europe in excellent condition and with proper posture, they were compelled to dance as an exercise. The insides of these decks were slimy and reeked of human waste. According to studies conducted and published in 1794, the average deck dimensions for a man were six feet by 14 inches, and for a woman, it was five feet by 14 inches. Per foot, the girls measured four feet 
six inches. Inside the deck, the air was sweltering, musty, and reeking of human feces and grime. Slaves endured dehydration and hunger on a daily basis because of a water supply that was inadequate, just 24 ounces, or about two 12-ounce soda cans worth of fluid. Horse beans and rice were their main sources of nutrition. Chained together by wrists and feet, the captives were crammed into tiers beneath the decks. There were a lot of problems along the journey. The hostages had to deal with things like epidemic sickness and pirate attacks. Also, slave dealers and crewmen abused them psychologically, sexually and physically. Historians suggest that the transatlantic slave trade cost the lives of 15 to 25 percent of the Africans enslaved on this journey. Slavery brought terrible circumstances to Africa. Only a small fraction of slaves made it to North America. Direct arrival in North America was experienced by less than 400,000 people, or around 4% of the total Africans transported. Brazil received over half of the 5 million slaves taken from Africa and transferred to the Americas. The other half went to the Caribbean and South America. I know you're probably thinking about how, on Earth, hundreds of crewmen couldn't be beaten by thousands of slaves. There was a well-known incident involving slaves from Africa who rose up in rebellion and commandeered their ships. This story's details are both fascinating and terrifying. This will be addressed later on, but for now, just know that slave dealers were armed and usually had the captives bound before bringing them to their destinations. Anyway, let's wrap up the transatlantic slave trade's history and economics Although it is commonly believed that the transatlantic route was the sole means of removing slaves from Africa, this is not necessarily the case. Half of all slaves traded or transported out of Africa did not make the journey over the Atlantic. From the years 650 to 1900, according to reports, a total of 10 million Africans were taken to Arabia, Yemen, Iran, India and Iraq as slaves by Islamic merchants. Slaves were brought over the Indian Ocean, the Red Sea, and the Sahara Desert. While some slaves stayed in Africa, the majority of those seized and sent across the Atlantic Ocean came from the area surrounding the Gulf of Guinea. Slavery was so pervasive in this area that nations like Togo, Benin, and Nigeria along the African coast were officially known as the Slave Coast. Central and West African countries supplied the bulk of the slaves. During the initial phases of the transatlantic slave trade, the Portuguese mostly acquired Africans as slaves as a result of tribal conflicts. The Portuguese, however, started to invade interior Africa in search of slaves in response to the rising demand for this commodity. An annual average of almost 85,000 people were removed from Africa in the 1800s up from 30,000 in the 1690s. Between the years 1700 and 1850, the majority of Africans who were enslaved managed to traverse the Atlantic without incident. About 80,000 Africans left the continent every year between 1821 and 1830, and another over a million made the journey to the Americas in the 20 years leading up to the slave trade's prohibition. By 1820, the ratio of Africans to Europeans transported over the Atlantic had nearly doubled, and women made up four out of five who made the journey. The years 1720-1780 saw the influx of most Africans sold into slavery in British North America. Most of the Africans transferred to Brazil came from Angola, whereas the majority of those sent to North America, including the Caribbean, came from West Africa. In 1825, the United States had over a quarter of the Western Hemisphere's population that was of African heritage, even though only approximately 6% of African prisoners were brought to British North America. Contrary to popular belief, slavery in the United States was in a completely different state. But first, let's discuss the 1839 revolt before we get into these unbelievable specifics. In 1839, as I indicated before, Slave dealers were trying to get another shipment of slaves across the Atlantic once again. However, this expedition would deliver a surprise that they were unprepared for 
unlike their prior ones. There were perhaps 100 slaves on the Amistad, Roughly 53 people who had been kidnapped from Africa a short time before staged a violent uprising as the ship sailed dangerously close to the Cuban coast. It was Joseph Sink who spearheaded the uprising. They beheaded the skipper and chef, leaving just the Spanish navigator alive to return them to Sierra Leone. But the sailor was successful in steering the Amistad northward. Two months later, the US off the New York coast of Long Island, the Navy managed to capture the ship. The mutineers were imprisoned at New Haven, Connecticut, while the ship was hauled to New London, Connecticut. For the abolitionist movement in the United States at the time, this was a watershed moment, both politically and legally. A federal trial was held in Hartford, Connecticut in 1840 in response to a demand by the Spanish Embassy for the return of the African slaves to Cuba. Abolitionist Louis Tappan of New England was able to defeat the pro-slavery United States government by rallying public support for African Americans, the state. But after the trial, President Martin Van Buren of the United States had a Navy ship sent to Connecticut to bring the Africans back to Cuba. This became intriguing when a legal procedure was initiated. Since the mutineers were enslaved people, the prosecution contended they had to follow the rules that dictated how slaves and masters interacted. At this point, things start to get intriguing. According to the evidence presented during the trial, although slavery itself was legal in Cuba, the practice of importing slaves from Africa was not. The judge reasoned that the Africans should be free to flee their captors in any manner they could, since they were not goods, but rather victims of kidnapping. Upon the United States government's plea to the US in the next year, the Amistad rebels were able to secure a verdict in their favor from the Supreme Court thanks to the efforts of former President John Quincy Adams. The highest court in the land confirmed the lower court's decision. The 35 remaining Africans were able to get passage home with the help of private and missionary societies. Along with five other professors and missionaries, they came to Sierra Leone in January 1842, where they helped establish a Christian mission. Even though Europeans deserve most of the guilt for the Atlantic slave trade, Africans were not the only ones participating. Kidnapping adults and children for the sake of sale was an activity in which Africans participated. They sold these prisoners for goods or weapons through European middlemen or agents, Slaves were often of a different ethnicity than the captors. Whether they were foes or natives of a nearby hamlet made little difference. The enslaved people were completely dehumanized and given the name Other when they were held captive. They were not considered to be members of the tribe or ethnic group. Also, African kings cared deeply about keeping their towns safe, but they would sometimes sell out criminals and thieves to slavery to rid themselves of them. Raids, including the use of firearms, were another common method of acquiring slaves. These raids were orchestrated by many ethnic groups, often in collaboration with the Europeans. Pernille Ibsen stated in her book, Daughters of the Trade, Atlantic Slavers and Interracial Marriage on the Gold Coast, that Africans living in what is now Ghana were also involved in the slave trade via interracial marriage a word meaning to marry with Portuguese roots. Casado was the word used. Slave traders and Europeans established political and economic ties using the term casado. Slave marriages were a typical tactic in the early days of the slave trade when wealthy West African families would force their daughters to marry slave traders from Europe. The Europeans had no problem with the marriages taking place according to African traditions because they knew these ties were crucial to their commercial success. The reason behind this is that diplomats dispatched by the monarch of Dahomey to Brazil and Portugal brought back information regarding their travels. Not to mention that a few Dahomeyan nobility had been enslaved in the United States before making their way back home. Thus, the legislation that forbade the enslavement of one's own Dahomey was the sole obstacle that the Kingdom of Dahomey faced in its fight against slavery. The death sentence was applied to anyone found guilty of this crime. The Kingdom's stance on this matter was negative, 
but their stance on slavery was not. On what is now Ghana, known as the Gold Coast, things were different. Those at the top of society would send their children to live in the forts and sail with the Europeans so that they might learn about the slave trade. To further their education, some even sent their children to the United States and Europe. Members of the Gold Coast elite also made pacts with the governments of the Netherlands and Great Britain to free friends who had fallen victim to American enslavement. On the other hand, many Africans who didn't know any better believed that the Europeans involved in the Atlantic slave trade were cannibals who intended to cook and devour their victims. The hostages on board the ships bound for Europe were already in a terrible state when this rumor spread. In America and across the world, countless lives were lost as a result of the transatlantic slave trade. It is believed that over a million individuals perished during the voyage to the New World, according to a BBC article. More succumbed to their awful illnesses shortly after they arrived. Even though it's hard to tell exactly how many slaves died throughout their enslavement, we do know that it probably exceeded the number of slaves who actually made it through the ordeal alive. Many lives and civilizations were wiped out as a result of the Atlantic slave trade. Roughly 12 million people were enslaved and transported across the Atlantic between the 16th and 19th centuries, with 1.5 million losing their lives while enslaved. Not only did many Africans perish during the Middle Passage, but slave raids and African conflicts also claimed the lives of a large number of people. Adam Jones, a Canadian researcher, described the killing of millions of Africans during this time as genocide. It was one of the greatest genocides that mankind had ever faced, he said. It was probably in the slave owner's best interest to keep the slaves alive rather than kill them, according to many who think the deaths weren't deliberate. Killings and devastation, according to Jones, were premeditated. No matter the motivations for keeping Atlantic Passage survivors for forced labor, we must return to the question of intent. Why shouldn't genocide be the outcome when identifiable actors knowingly sustain and grow an institution at the expense of a specific human group? American academic writer Sadia Hartman, who specializes in African-American studies, contends that the enslaved people's deaths were a byproduct of capitalism's pursuit of profit. She contends that commerce's inexorable toll on human life renders the millions of lives lost meaningless rather than an end in and of itself. When there are no humans involved, when there is no normative value to life, and when the community is essentially considered dead, then death occurs accidentally. Although the Atlantic slave trade did result in millions of fatalities, Sadia Hartman argues that this time extermination was not the primary objective, but rather a major byproduct of the production of commodities in contrast to the gulag and concentration camps. On the other hand, the Oro Confederacy, Ikwera, Igala, Kabu, Bono State, Oyo, Ashanti, and Dahomey were among the African nations that were more severe in this regard. As a matter of fact, Africans participated extensively in and even helped the slave trade. However, it cannot be denied that the Europeans were instrumental in providing the necessary incentives for this activity to flourish. One of the letters that Mani Congo and Zinga member Afonso wrote to King Wael III of Portugal asks the king to cease providing goods that are causing the tribes to fight with each other. Instead of providing goods, he implores the king to send missionaries. In a letter he wrote, Each day the traders are kidnapping our people, children of this country, sons of our nobles and vassals, even people of our own family. This corruption and depravity are so widespread that our land is entirely depopulated. We need in this kingdom only priests and school teachers, and no merchandise unless it is wine and flour for mass. It is our wish that this kingdom is not a place for the trade or transport of slaves. Many of our subjects eagerly lust over Portuguese merchandise that your subjects have brought into our domains. To satisfy this inordinate appetite, they seize many of our black free subjects. They sell them after having taken these prisoners to the coast secretly or at night. As soon as the captives are in the hands of white men, they are branded with a red-hot iron.
Many countries who gained economically from the transatlantic slave trade have since apologized, despite the fact that the trade had far-reaching consequences. UNESCO declared August 23rd to be the International Day for the Remembrance of the Slave Trade and its Abolition in 1998. A chain reaction of subsequent events acknowledged slavery's negative impact on Africa. While attending the 2001 World Conference Against Racism in Durban, South Africa, African nations pushed for a sincere apology from countries that had traded slaves. A number of countries were prepared to issue an apology. Opposing nations, including the US, UK, Portugal, Spain and the Netherlands, obstructed any effort to do so. Potentially motivating this resistance on the part of these governments is a fear that acknowledging their complicity in slavery would compel them to pay reparations to the impacted African nations. A persistent endeavor by the United Nations has been underway since 2009. It was necessary to establish the United Nations Holocaust Memorial to honor the sacrifices made by those enslaved in the Atlantic slave trade. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up. It really helps us out. And don't forget to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell so you won't miss our future videos. We appreciate your support and look forward to seeing you in the next video.